Hi, Integrated Math One. Uh, we're just doing our review today. So I have in front of me my 4.1 study guide, which you should have in front of you as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over each of these problems and give a little explanation on each one of these today. So on our 4.1 study guide, the very first problem, we have a histogram. This histogram represents the ages of swimmers. Um, and we have a couple of questions. We have this lovely histogram here. You can see this is our number of swimmers and we have our bins is our age in years, so 6 to 8, 8 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 14, and 14 to 16. So we want to know how many swimmers are represented on the histogram. Well, I just need to know how many swimmers in each bin, right? So it looks like I've got seven swimmers here. I've got six swimmers here, eight swimmers here, uh, seven swimmers here, and we only have five swimmers in this last little bin. So if I want to know how many swimmers are represented on the histogram, I just have to add those together, right? So seven plus six plus eight plus seven plus five. And I am, of course, going to use a calculator to help me work all this out. So seven plus six plus eight plus seven plus five um, looks like I have 33 swimmers. Yay. So there are 33 swimmers represented on this lovely histogram. Now question B asks how many swimmers are older than 10? Well, here's 10. So I'm going to kind of draw a line here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. This is my dividing line. So I just want the swimmers older than 10, which is these three bins, these three bars. So it looks like I have 8 plus 7 plus 5. And again, if I use my lovely calculator, 8 plus 7 plus 5. Looks like I have 20 swimmers that are older than 10. Hooray. Uh, down below on the page, we have problem number two. On problem number two, we have a box and whisker plot. The box and whisker plot represents the number of laps students ran around a track. So this is the laps per student. You can see my lovely box and whisker plot, minimum, maximum. Here's my median, my first quartile, and my third quartile. Now, part question A says, is the median or the mean a better measure of center of the data set? Explain your reasoning. Well, I'm looking at this, and this is really skewed, isn't it? Um, this is definitely not symmetrical. If this is my center, my right whisker is way longer than my left whisker. So I'm going to say the median is a better measure of center. We do have to explain why, so I'm going to say because the data, oops, sorry about that, the data is skewed right. My right side is way too long, right? It's not symmetrical. The right side got a little stretched out. So the median is a better measure of center because the data is skewed right. It's just how it goes. Now, B is an interesting question. What percent of students ran less than three laps? Well, if you recall, each chunk is a quarter of my data, right? That's why we've got quartiles. Each chunk is 25% of my data. Like this tiny little whisker is 25% of the students. This half of the box is 25% of the students. This half of the box is 25% of my students. And this long whisker, is 25% of my students. Each chunk is 25%. Well, if I want to know the percent of students that ran less than three laps, this is three. So again, I'm going to draw a nice line coming through. Oh, and only this tiny little whisker is less than three. So it looks like 25% of the students ran less than three laps. As we can see, just that 25% chunk is below three. Awesome. You turn the page, I turn my page too. <coughs> it brings us over to question number three. A group of friends compared the number of books they read over the summer holidays. The table shows the number of books read per person. Determine the five number summary of the data set. So the first thing I need to do is I need to put this stuff in order. And that's always where I make my mistakes. It's just 
how it is. So I'm going to start just by organizing my data, putting it all in order, least to greatest. So I see I have a one here. Cross it out as I go. I also am going to line it up just below just to make sure I don't lose anything. So one, I have a two. Um, I've got a three. Oh, and another three. There we go. Um, I have a seven. Oh, and another seven. I've got a couple of eights. There's an eight and an eight and another eight. I've got three of those. And I have a 10 and I have an 11. All right. So I just cross off as I go to make sure I don't lose anything. I also like to line it up just to make sure I have the same number that I started with. Like I said, this is where I make my mistakes. Because finding my five number summary is pretty easy. Um, so the five number summary means that we need to find the minimum. We need to find our first quartile. We need to find our median. We need to find our third quartile. And we need to find our maximum. I'm running out of space, but we're going to make it work. All right, minimum's easy. It's one. Ha, ah, yay. Maximum is easy. It's 11. Woo, those are the easy ones. Now, if you recall, the median is the one in the middle, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's this guy. There we go. So again, if you kind of bounce your fingers along, you'll find that seven is in the exact middle, so that's my median. Now, to find my quartiles, I'm going to remove the median. I'm going to strike out the median. I don't want the median in the way for my quartiles. And again, we're just going to find the middle of the lower half for our first quartile. Looks like that's this guy right here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yep. So three is my first quartile. And then my middle of the upper half will give me my third quartile. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Oh, yep, that guy right there. That eight is right in the middle. So eight is my third quartile. And you just did your five number summary. Like I said, it's not hard. I just make mistakes when I try to line up my numbers. It's always my problem. So let's go ahead and go further down the page to number four. And I have here a table with a sample of wait times in minutes for two airlines. So I have the wait times for my air airlines and I have wait times for fly high airlines. We're asked to do a few things. We're asked to find the interquartile range for each airline and then we'll have to use it to answer B to identify any outliers. So first things first, first things first, um, I've got to put these in order. <laughs> this is a hot mess. These are all over the place. And again, this is where I make my mistakes, so just be really careful. It looks like zero is my lowest. Wow, no wait time at all, that's nice. Looks like I have a five minute wait time. Um, what's next? Oh, I have an 11, I think that's next if I'm going in order. 15, again, I like putting it right next to it just so I can help keep track of things. Um, I have a 19, I have a 20, uh, let's see. Oh, I have another 20. There's two 20s. I'm going to get my other 20 in there. Um, 26. Let's see. 33. I've got two 33s. That, 33, 33. Um, I have a 34. Sorry, my pen's gone wonky. And I have a 40 right at the top there. There we go. 40. So now I have everybody in order. Hooray. Let's go ahead and put fly high airlines in order as well. Just makes things easier. Looks like the smallest I have is seven. That's the very least. I have an eight. Uh, 14. Is that the next one? It looks like it. So 14, 15, 16, Let's see, doo, 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 doo. Uh, I've got some 20s here. 27, I guess, is the next one. It's 27. Oh, I messed up. I told you this is where I mess up. Hang on. There's a 24. Ha <laughs> ha. So 24 and then 27. There we go. It's 24 and 27. Uh, 29. I have a 30. 32. Uh, let's see, 45 and 49. Now, of course, if I want to calculate the interquartile range, I'm going to grab another color here. If I want to calculate my interquartile range, 
we have to do our third quartile minus the first quartile. So I need to find my quartiles. So let's go ahead and split this up. Um, I got to cut it in half first and then cut it into quarters, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 numbers means I should be able to go down six. One, two, three, four, five, six, there it is. And what's nice is because I have this table and they're all like cut up like that, I can just like cut my table like that, makes it easy. So that looks like my, uh, that gives me my median, but I don't want my median. I want my inner quartile range. So I need quartiles. So let's go ahead and cut the upper half in half. We'll cut our lower half in half. So just cut it up into chunks, cut it up into quarters. So it looks like my first quartile, that's 11, that's 15. Well, halfway between those would be 13. So it looks like my first quartile for my air is 13. These are both 33, so it looks like my third quartile is 33. So for my air, if I want to find my interquartile range, this is what, make sure you label, make sure you label, I have to do 33 minus 13, which is, of course, 20. Um, let's talk about fly high airlines. Again, I want to find my interquartile range, so let's see. Looks like my first quartile is between 14 and 15, so that would be 14.5. My third quartile is between 30 and 32, so that would be 31. So it looks like I have to do 31, my third quartile, minus 14.5, which is my first quartile. Grab my calculator here, so useful. 31 minus 14.5 gives me 16.5. So I found the interquartile range for my air and the interquartile range for fly high airlines. Last but not least, we have to identify any outliers of the data set. Now, real quick, let's just remind ourselves, okay? Remember that you have to use fences, right? We got to show some work here. The lower fence is your first quartile minus your interquartile range times 1.5. And remember that your upper fence is your third quartile plus your inner quartile range times 1.5. So we need to do this for each of these. All of our numbers should be inside those fences, should be between our lower and upper fence. Anything lower than the lower fence is an outlier. Anything greater than the upper fence is an outlier. So let's just take them one at a time and have your calculator handy. So my air for the lower fence our first quartile, we said, was 13 minus my inner quartile range of 20 times 1.5. And I'm totally going to use a calculator. 20 times 1.5 is 30. And then 13 minus 30 is negative 17. Let's do the upper fence. My third quartile is 33 plus that 20.1.5. 20 times 1.5. Sorry about that. We already know 20 times 1.5 is 30. We just did it. Plus 33 is 63. So let's take a look at my air's data. There's nothing less than negative 17, right? It only goes down to zero. Um, the upper fence is 63. It only goes up to 40, so we don't go over 63. So I would say that my air has no outliers. Let's talk about fly high. So the lower fence for fly high, our first quartile is 14.5 minus my interquartile range of 16.5 times 1.5. So 16.5 times 1.5 is 24.75. And if I do 14, 0.5 minus 24.75. Thank you, Mr. Calculator. I get a lower fence of negative 10.25. For my upper fence on fly high, my third quartile was 31 plus my interquartile range of 16.5 times 1.5. We already did that 16.5 times 1.5. We already found that was 24.75. And if I add that to my 31, I get an upper fence of 55.75.
So let me take a look at my data real quick. Let me look at my data. My lower fence is negative 10.5. The lowest I go is 7, so I'm not lower than the lower fence. My upper fence is 55.75, but the highest this goes is 49, so there's nothing above my upper fence, which means it's all okay. There's no outliers for fly high. Please keep in mind, you can't just tell me, yes, there's an outlier, no, there's not an outlier. You have to actually do the work and show me, all right? You gotta show it to me, it's just how it goes. So let's go ahead and turn to the next page. Flip over a little bit here to get over to problem number five. I have a lovely data set. It is a very small data set for which I am most grateful. We're asked to start off by calculating the mean of the data set. Remember X bar? We use that to, for mean, it means mean, yeah. <laughs> so in order to find the mean, I just have to add them up and divide by how many there are. So seven plus eight plus nine plus 10 plus 10 plus 12 plus 14. And I need to divide by how many there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great. All right. So let's work this out. 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 10 plus 12 plus 14 gives me 70. Oh, I didn't even need the calculator for this. I can do this. 70 divided by 7 is 10. Yay. So the mean is 10. Awesome. Wonderful. Good job, us. Now, we are asked to cancel, calculate the sample standard deviation for the data set. Now, we know Desmos can do this, but we also know how to do this by hand. So, it's not that bad. It's a small data set. So, remember, the first step is to take each number and subtract out the mean. So, 7 minus 10, 8 minus 10, uh, 9 minus 10, 10 minus 10, 10 minus 10, 12 minus 10, and 14 minus 10. So we're going to subtract all of these, and then when we subtract them, remember that you square it. Okay, so we're going to subtract and then square, subtract and then square. Please remember that when you square a negative, it becomes a positive, right? Negative times a negative is a positive, so don't forget that. 7 minus 10 is a negative 3. Negative 3 squared is a positive 9. 8 minus 10 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is a positive 4. 9 minus 10 is negative 1. Square that, it's a positive 1. 10 minus 10 is 0. 0 squared is 0. Again, 10 minus 10 is 0. 0 squared is 0. 12 minus 10 is 2. 2 squared is 4. And 14 minus 10 is 4, but if I square that, I get 16. Now, remember the next step is to add them all up. Let's do the total here, people. If we add all these up, grab my calculator here. 9 plus 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 4 plus 16. If I add those all up, I get a total of 34. The last step, the last step was we're going to take our 34. We're going to divide it by the number minus 1. We said there were 7 of them. We're going to subtract 1, and after we divide, we'll do the square root. So, of course, 34 divided by uh, 7 minus 1. Well, 30, 7 minus 1 is 6, yeah, so I'm just going to do that. I'm going to grab my calculator. So, 34 divided by 6. I get like 5.6 is going forever. I'm going to keep it in my calculator, though, because we're not done yet. I need to do the square root. So the square root of this gives me about 2.38. Boom! Just found your standard deviation. Hey. Not bad, not bad, not bad. All right, all right. Number six. Oh, I got to turn the page. Hang on. There we are. Number six. We're supposed to analyze the data sets below. I've got set A, I've got set B. First, we're asked to describe the distribution of each data set. So let's talk. Set A um, it's concentrated around the center, kind of even at the sides. I'm going to say that set A is symmetrical. 
right? I mean, the two sides are pretty even there. Uh, it's pretty nicely done. Um, set B. Let's look at set B's distribution and the shape here. Oh my gosh. Everything's kind of clustered off to the left and then it kind of like trails off off to the right. This is not symmetrical, right? This is not symmetrical at all. So I'm going to say that set B is skewed. And because there's this bit like pulling off to the right, like hanging off to the right a little bit, it's like a little dangly hanging there. I'm going to say that it's skewed right. So we describe the distribution. Set A is symmetrical. Set B is skewed right. Now, part B says to predict which of the data sets has a higher standard deviation. We want to explain our reasoning. Please remember that standard deviation is a measure of spread. How spread out is your data, right? How far, how spread out from the center. So if I were to look here at, a, at six, uh, pardon me, at set A, my center, I don't know, is probably around here somewhere. I mean, it's pretty symmetrical. And so it looks like stuff's kind of spread out and spread out. Um, but if I look at B, my center is going to be kind of off to the side, right? I mean, I don't know exactly where, but I suspect my center is going to be somewhere, my data is going to be kind of over this way somewhere, which means it's not spread out real far here, but it's really spread out off to the right, isn't it? So you know what? We've got a bigger spread happening on set B. So I'm going to say that set B... Um, would have a higher standard deviation and we do have to explain why so I'll say because the data is more spread out from the center. So I would say set B would have a higher standard deviation because the data is more spread out from the center. It didn't ask us to actually calculate it or find it. We're just looking at how spread out stuff is. And that tells me if it's more spread out, higher standard deviations. Not as spread out, it's a lower standard deviation. Last but not least, question number seven. The table compares sample wait times and minutes to be seated at two popular restaurants. We want to determine an appropriate measure of center and spread for each data set. Now, they were so nice here. For restaurant A, I don't know if you noticed, but they're all in order. Um, 23, 28, 36, 36, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 50, and 54. Um, and same thing with restaurant B, they're in order, which is really nice of them to do because as I've said, that's where I make my mistakes. Now, in order to determine an appropriate measure of center and spread, should we use mean or the median? Should we use the standard deviation or the interquartile range? We have to figure out if our data is symmetric or skewed. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a really quick box and whisker plot, okay? Um, here's my minimum. Here's my maximum. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So here's my median right there. Um, I'll strike that out in order to help me find my uh, quartiles. So looks like then one, two, three, four, five. Oh, this guy then should be my first quartile. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, so this guy should be my third quartile. So I'm just going to make a really quick box and whisker plot. It is not going to be fancy. Um, I'm going from 23 and I need to get all the way up to 60. So I'm going to count by fives, I think. So 20, 25, 30. 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, and 60. So I'm just counting by fives. I'm going to make a nice little box and whisker plot here. So my minimum is at 23, so I don't know, about there. My first quartile is at 36. My median is at 40. My third quartile is about 43. My maximum is about 54. Now, this isn't perfect, but if I connect my box in the middle and I do my whiskers out the side, 
that's pretty symmetrical, right? I mean, I don't know that's perfect, but it's pretty good. So I'm going to say that restaurant A is symmetric, which means we should use, we should use the mean and standard deviation. So restaurant A is pretty symmetric, so mean and standard deviation, that's going to work well for that data set. I'm going to grab another color here to do restaurant B. So again, I have my minimum, I have my maximum. Um, it's pretty lined up pretty well, so here's my median, which I'm going to strike out to help me find my quartiles, which are here and here. All right, let's do our box and whisker plot. 24, about there. Uh, 25, whoa, right next to it. Uh, 31, which is over here, 40, which is over here, and all the way up to 60. Wow, okay. Um, I connect the middle three for my box. And I have a tiny whisker there and a really long whisker. Oh my gosh. This is way skewed. <laughs> this is definitely not symmetrical. This is my center. My right side is way too long. So I'm going to say it's skewed right and since it is skewed right we should use the median and the interquartile range the iqr yeah hope you found this helpful and i hope you found this useful if you got questions come talk to me and i'll see you guys soon bye